I now call to order this meeting of the Assembly Rules Committee of the Whole. It is Friday, March 24, 2023. This is a special meeting of the committee. We are scheduled from 12.20 until 1.20 p.m. today. We're starting just a few minutes late at 12.25. Documents for this committee meeting can be found online at muni.org slash assembly. If you navigate to the committee page under meetings, you can find the agenda and the draft resolution as well. We'll go ahead and start with assembly member introductions for the record. Pete Peterson. Kevin Cross. Felix Rivera. Suzanne LaFrance and Joey Sweet um, stepped out. He's he's here. And then on the phone, we have Ms. Quinn Davidson. Hi, everyone. Thanks. And also Mr. Solt. Hello, everybody. Thank you. And then we are also joined by the acting municipal manager. Kent Coles. Alexis Johnson, Anchorage Health Department. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We have a number of members of the community. Too. Thank you for joining this meeting. I just want to note that um, our rules committee meetings tend to be a little more informal, and we typically go by first names in this meeting. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Felix, and then I will um, manage the queue when it comes to questions and um, any discussion. Go ahead, Felix. Thanks, Suzanne. <clears throat> All right, so we have, um, everyone should have the draft document in front of them. It's not completed, obviously, so I have to uh, fill out the whereas statements, but I think the important stuff, the sections, <clears throat> are a reflection of the most recent Housing and Homelessness Committee, um, as well as some follow-up conversations. So folks will remember that the administration presented their thoughts to us on a demobilization plan for emergency shelter in February. And then the emergency shelter task force also sent us some recommendations to consider. Um, er earlier this month at the committee, we talked through all of those options, put some new options on the table. And then one option came to me after the meeting when I attended a convening of the Fairview Community Council last weekend. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm going to be super blunt with folks as we start looking into this, <clears throat> that there are no good options for demobilization that are turnkey and ready to go, well, except for maybe like a couple. More than likely, what we will see is an increase in unsheltered homelessness in Anchorage as some of the housing units in the former Barrett Inn, former Lakeshore Inn are brought online. And hopefully the former Golden Lion is brought online as quickly as possible as well. That will help alleviate the situation, but won't necessarily solve it. Um, I don't see any way that we can get sanctioned camps up, camps up and running this summer, uh, which is why that's um, this is phrased the way that it is. And then I do have a bit of a doubt about the old Alaska Native Charter School based off the reports that I reviewed on the needed repairs, but um, still on here as, let's look at it. Let's let's see what's going on. The other options are hit or miss. We did get a hit with the Aviator Hotel, though, which has offered <clears throat> 72 rooms through September 30th. We would just need to find the funding for that. Um, from my perspective, this plan looks at all the things that have been presented to us from all the different angles and explores all the possible short-term solutions, which is what we should be doing. For the purposes of today's meetings, um, I wanted to go through this, see what questions folks had, changes they wanted to make, discuss any additions, hear from the administration and the coalition. And after that, my hope is actually to start acting on the sections in the resolution if we come to some type of agreement today so that I don't have to waste the next few weeks waiting for us to approve this on April 11th. I just want to start getting to work on some of this stuff and seeing what's actually reality. So that's pretty much the plan for today. Perhaps we could start by hearing from the administration and the coalition. And before we go to Kent and Alexis, I want to note for the record that we were joined by Robin Dern at 1228 and Dan Volan at 1229. Uh, uh, 
through the charity of feelings, first names. So yeah, we're more yeah, casual. Very casual. Okay. So um, we just got this a few minutes ago. I think I saw it 45 minutes ago. So we, I'm not sure that we're really prepared to offer much in the way of questions or be able to answer any specific questions that you may have on this right now. I think, um, you know, our, our, our offer would be to give us time to review it and have some more discussions and maybe have a follow up committee meeting or work session on it. So thank you. Alexis, did you want to add anything as to like what you're working on and what the plan is on your end? Yeah, uh, through the chair. Um, so we did receive this within the last two hours. Uh, this is the first time we've seen it. Um, some of these things were proposed six weeks ago by the administration uh, for discussion. So as far as uh, planning for some of these, we do have a little bit of work such as sanctioned camping. I've shared some of that with members um, in this room. Uh, some of the research we have, uh, we have some questions about section three using the short term usage of the facility um, because we do have a private donor that'd be willing to purchase it. Um, but I believe we'd have to enter into a multi-year contract with them. Um, outreach, we can discuss. Um, the coalition currently has a contract with the municipality for outreach. And so um, the discussion, rather than having additional funding, would be to swap um, for housing-driven housing outreach rather than contact-driven um, to save some of the funding, if that's the plan. Um, we are willing to put out a request for information always um, for a non-congregate shelter location. Uh, we have been looking into pallet shelters for about a year now. Um, I've had extensive conversations with Mr. Cross, uh, some with Mr. Voland, and then with community leaders who are willing to uh, put in the time and effort free of charge to, to really get these things up and running. Um, and then... I'm interested to hear more about the hard to handle individuals. Um, that's not a uh, verbiage that I'm familiar with. Um, usually that language is a little bit more inclusive for problematic people experiencing homelessness. So other than that uh, discussion of the soul of an arena, I'm interested in that as well. So thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, Meg Zelotel, Executive Director of the Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness. A few comments. Um, I'm going to go in opposite order, starting with Section 7. Um, I agree with Ms. Johnson about the idea of hard-to-handle individuals experiencing homelessness. I would much rather look at circumstance-based um, issues. Um, remember, these are individuals who have experienced considerable trauma, um, who may have um, behavioral health or substance misuse needs, but those are circumstances. They aren't labeling it as hard to handle individuals puts that on the person versus maybe the circumstances they're facing. So please consider uh, people first language. Um, with regard to uh, possible locations for non-congregate shelter, um, I was aware of the aviator opportunity as well. Um, my question is who would be prioritized and how might we be able to help with that prioritization, either based on vulnerability or, or some other um, option. Um, I would prefer to look at potentially coordinated entry, which is how we use vulnerability to prioritize people for housing. Um, I think for shelter, it might also work. Um, with regard to outreach, Contact-driven versus housing-driven outreach, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, and I think it's short-sighted to think one versus the other. Um, I think we need to do both, um, and I'm happy to talk with you specifically about what those things look like. There's an intersection of the two, um, and then I would just share briefly, um, we're working right now as we move toward what might be the end of the Sullivan Arena and other emergency cold weather shelter locations, really focused on coordinated entry, making sure everyone we can get in contact with is in the system so we know who they are, where they are, and that we have update, updated information um, and that they are prioritized for housing. Um, we're putting considerable resources towards that over the next five weeks. Um, we think that that's kind of the baseline in this moment while we continue um, to see what's next. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks to the administration and <clears throat> the coalition for providing your perspectives on this. So I guess questions I have 
Um, so for on section seven, um, again, as I said in my beginning comments, this is something that came out of the Fairview Community Council um, convening that they had last week. <clears throat> just one of the ideas that they had um, felt like we needed to address. So the if I'm hearing correctly from the coalition, your suggestion is to replace the language for hard to handle individuals to make it circumstance based. I'm, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. Sure. To be specific about what you're talking about, are you talking about individuals experiencing chronic homelessness? Are you talking about individuals experiencing homelessness who also have behavioral health needs? Are you talking about individuals experiencing homelessness who also have substance misuse issues? Like, just be specific because a okay. specific specific language will lead to specific ideas and solutions and outcomes. Got it. <clears throat> And then um, on section five, so if I'm understanding correctly, the coalition's concern was just the use of sh the word shelter. Did I understand that correct? So you're just saying we should look for just more non-congregate space period? I said if there was the idea to continue <clears throat> the use of the aviator, the question is who would be prioritized for those rooms? Um, if we, okay. If this will be all the additional shelter space that will exist, um, that would be low barrier beyond Brother Francis, which is full and running a wait list. We would just want to know what that prioritization looked like so that we can make sure we stay coordinated and provide accurate information for people seeking shelter. Thanks. And, and that is a d decision that who would make? Would it be the administration? Would it be the provider? It would be up to the policymakers if they wanted okay. to make that contingent on the funding or leaving it open and then it would be within the, um, my understanding would be within the grant slash contract implementation. Um, but we would recommend using some kind of prioritization that we otherwise already have really that focuses on those who are most vulnerable. Okay. Um, and then uh, just let me double check. <clears throat> so I, uh, I guess for the administration on section three, um, so if I understood your concern correctly, it's around the, the usage of the term short-term usage of the former Alaska Native Charter School. So, I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's either we use it as on a permanent basis or we shouldn't use it at all. Like, can you just help me flesh that out? <clears throat> yeah, through the chair to Felix. When we had proposed this, we had a donor come forward and say, hey, we'd like to acquire this building um, and let you guys use it. Um, on a lease basis until they recoup their funding. Um, so depending on how the length of time your your lease uh, payment would go up or go down. Um, but short term, I think needs to be defined because if it's just for 90 to 120 days, I don't think that would be a feasible option. But if we're looking short term, you know, the next three years uh, in definition of short term, I think that's something that we could possibly discuss and explore. Thank you. All right. I think those were the clarifying questions I had. I, I guess if I, I would like to hear from members, because I think, as I said earlier, what I this is going to be before us in some form on April 11th. But <clears throat> what I want, I don't. I, what I want to do by between now and April 11th is really start working on some of these sections and start working with the administration and others to be implementing these, because uh, time is of the essence. Thanks. Thanks, Felix. And I just want to note for everyone, too, that we're all seeing this for the first time, and that's the intent of this meeting, is to have this real live discussion about um, how to put something together, if I understood correctly, Felix, and as far as, you know, getting feedback and identifying questions. So anybody want in the queue? Kevin? Yeah. Madam Chair, Kevin Tyson, we can't hear him. 
Thanks, Randy. Is your mic on? Kevin's going to get a new mic. <laughs> Testing. The love boat. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Randy. Technical I was wondering what happened. <laughs> Normally, I have no problem being heard. So... So looking at shelters typically don't have all those amenities of homes. They don't have bathrooms, they don't have kitchens. They provide, you know, um, a place to stay out of the water, weather and, and, and stay out of the elements. I'd really like us to look at those uh, ASD connexes that were offered to us six or eight months ago. Um, if we can come up with something that has temporary, uh, you know, bathroom facilities and showers, then those could be used as shelter since, you know, I guess my thought is if, if Sullivan Arena is coming down, we want to keep people out of the elements. We don't want them in tents. But if we're willing to, if if we're willing to acquiesce and 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 people are that's even out there that there's going to be some sort of campground, I would much rather see people housed in at least structures, temporarily with uh with bathrooms and things like that and being treated humanely. Um, those were offered free, and you know, and it'd be a lot easier to place them in the spring and the summer than trying to find a place during the winter. So I think that we should readdress one of those as the opportunities, how many we had, what that would look like. Um, because what we're going to do is anytime, and we did this before we come up with these dates, but if we don't have stuff, we paint ourselves into a corner. And then we end up like we did last summer where we take Sullivan arena down, we do a camp and then we open it back up again and nobody wants to see that happen. So if we're going to if we're going to paint ourselves into a corner with this specific date, which I support, then we need to be all hands on deck of where are we going to do the substitute. And if it's shelter that we're looking for, which is all Sullivan Arena is providing, that comes in multiple forms. And I think those connexes are a, a resource that we probably have not been giving cons, uh, you know adequate consideration. So thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Randy. Thanks, Suzanne. <clears throat> so I just want to thank, first, thank Felix for bringing these forward. Uh, thanks, Alexis, for bringing your ideas forward a couple months ago. I'm glad to see we're kind of aligning the ships. Uh, I'd like to see the administration and assembly work together. That would be incredible. Um, I A couple things. I, I do think camping is possible, and <clears throat> people are going to camp anyway, and I think that something's better than nothing, and I, and I disagree. I think it'll take us three months to get something like that ready if we put the right charge would i I'm, I'm in portland and portland has an area that they set up that is kind of like the pallet homes I, i'd almost call them more sheds and these sheds um have beds have basic amenities such as heat electricity they don't have running water um but they do have a centralized site on on basically a city block that they took over that does have running water has the bathroom and, and what I like about it is that it gives that, that hard-sided feel to it. It gives people that um, maybe sense of pride or even ownership that this is their space and they can shut the door and have some privacy. And you've even seen some of them, they'll start to put little pots outside or plants. So again, taking pride in who they are and where they are. <clears throat> um, I really like that very simple, maybe it's the Connex, maybe it's the pallet shelter, but more of a hard-sided, simple, shelter for people to kind of call their home as traditional. Going to the aviator, um, I think I followed that language. And I think for me, it's, it's more what I saw at the Sullivan when I go there is people in wheelchairs, people um, that are disabled, not necessarily, not necessarily mentally handicapped. Um, but I'd like to see, thank you for Meg with the link here. Tell us if our seat first. Take, take care of our our either most needy or best opportunities. Um, and then the, let's see, the last, um, I just wanted, maybe Alexis can tell us that the cost difference between the Sullivan and the Aviator. Um, not that at this point cost is a big focus of mine, it's more solving the problem. And then I wouldn't mind seeing us look at, again, I hate to bring it up with the NAV Center, and I'm gonna say the NAV Center and not the shelter associated with it, but maybe we can get another nav center put up in that part of town that's not necessarily housing people, um, that's near the resources. So hopefully that helps. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the feedback. Thanks, Randy. Daniel? Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so Kent, you might flag for, for section six to go back to Quincy Arms 
and bring that item back before us. But with the requested amendments from that work session that we had on the um, the portables um, that Kevin's talking about, because I think there was interest in that, but it got brought before us multiple times without those requested amendments. So I don't know what happened there, but um, I'm certainly interested in that. Um, you know, whether it's um, the ASD portables or pallet shelters, small homes, um, I think that using those as as transitional for folks, um, while they may be awaiting long term housing placement, could be really beneficial and for them to have a uh, some privacy and and place to store their stuff may be um, preferable over um, sort of a, a mass shelter approach. So I'd love to keep talking about that. I guess when I'm when I'm looking at this item as a whole, I really appreciate um, the way member Rivera, the way Felix has, has brought this forward. And I think this is signaling to me that there's an openness to dialogue and collaboration and creativity and out of the box thinking. Um, I do appreciate uh, Alexis uh, that your colleague and and yourself shared with me the some of the research that you've had been doing on station camps or safe sleeping sites and how those are being implemented in other cities. Um, again, I, I, I think I'll just reiterate that there was some some reactivity to that idea when it first presented. Um, but I think if if that's something that we can approach with careful consideration and and really acknowledge the investment that that would take um, to stand something up in, in a serious way, certainly I'm open to, to that conversation. And I think what I'll probably do is have the clerk's office um, circulate that email to to all the members just so they can contemplate it as well. Um, let's see. I definitely want to support as much outreach as we can this summer, because I think that's going to be really crucial. Um, so both the contact and housing driven outreach, I, th I think are very valuable. Um, and then, shoot, I had one other thing I wanted to say, but my, um, oh, as far as prioritizing who, pri who gets prioritizing for housing, um, I'm just going to throw this out there and this is not fully fleshed or processed, but I think this is, we are a, a little bit riffing right now based off of this item um, before us. And I think, uh, Suzanne, you said that was kind of the purpose of this meeting is to sort of digest this in real time and have a conversation. Um, I know that the, um, the administration has been hosting job fairs um, at the Sullivan Arena and the Guest House, which I think is really exciting. And, and there were many applicants and um, some conditional hires made for work with, I think, healthy spaces under, under Parks and Rec. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Um, and I, I do, I, I wonder if incentivizing, um, ooh, Well, that's uh, being cleaned up. I'm going to invite uh, Director Braniff up to talk okay. about some of the jobs that were filled at the the job Great. fair. And then just just before, just just throwing a thought out there. And again, this is not fully fleshed. This is not like I've reviewed code or anything like that. But the idea of incentivizing um, folks that that um, are hired with with maybe prioritizing housing for them. Um, yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Sure. Through the chair. Thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, job fair took place um, on Wednesday at the Sullivan Arena and on Thursday at the guest house uh, housing facility, former guest house. Um, almost 100 people, 101 people total were interviewed. I think we had 58 on the first day at the uh, Sullivan Arena, and so we had the balance, so 40-some-odd people at the guest house the next day. We had, I believe it was, so 41 total conditional offers uh, were made to the applicants, 
And these are for uh, L71 uh, parks and rec positions. That's the uh, collective bargaining or group or union. Um, and that's park maintenance, horticulture, and healthy spaces, the cleanup group. That's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. The I guess I elaborate a little bit. We're challenged to find enough people to uh, to fill out these work groups, and it's no different than anybody else that's uh, trying to find people in this current labor market. And so to um, connect people that are looking for work, um, we know they want to work from the conversations we have, and of course we know we need people. It's yeah, it's been fantastic. So thanks for the update. Appreciate that. Felix, and then Pete, and then I put myself in the queue. Okay, actually, we'll go to you next, Pete. Thanks, Suzanne. And I was just going to ask Michael before he got away, um, what, what, what uh, what's the hourly wage starting for some of these positions and is is i mean is it a, a livable wage 15 20 dollars an hour or more what sure uh and thank you for asking um uh through the chair uh so the job starts at each of these jobs start at uh oh it's 18 dollars an hour and 18 10 18 20 an hour it's right in that range um and um yeah, that's that's where it starts at. So, yeah. But, you know, that's actually about twice what the minimum wage is. So that's better than they could get some places, probably. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Felix? <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, so first, just because a few folks have commented on this. You know, we haven't used the rules committee in this way in a while. So this is sort of old school, what Suzanne and I are, are doing here. We used to bring draft items to this committee all the time where we would spend time reviewing items um, while they're still in draft form. Um, we just haven't done that in a while. So, but getting to the point. <clears throat> so um, I have a question for the coalition uh, before I get that, just a comment. So because uh, we've been having a little bit of discussion about the prioritization definition. Uh, for my part, I think it is okay for us to prioritize housing for individuals who are perhaps workforce ready. I think that is appropriate. But I hope what we don't go down is the path of saying, accept a job from us now, and that's the only way you will get housing. That concerns me. Um, now, question to the coalition. Um, uh, realize that, realizing that we are going to be having an increased, num increased excuse me, number of unsheltered individuals in our community, so people are going to be naturally going to uh, be camping. I wonder if the coalition can speak to that reality and how outreach might play into that. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one is... I think it would be great to partner with Parks and Rec and Healthy Spaces and, and think about if there's going to be camping happening, we, we can kind of predict where it's going to happen based on historical trends and where we know people are going to go. Can we layer in any public health and safety amenities to curb some of the effects of camping? Um, can we work together? Obviously, if we're doing um, outreach and we know where people can access a restroom or trash or food regularly, all of that helps curb. And I think that's an easy potential for partnership. Um, additionally, um, the idea of the navigation center, we can <clears throat> do a lot of that on a mobile basis. We just, we've got computers, we've got hotspots, we can go to the people. Um, the big things you need though, of course, are things to help people address their immediate needs before expecting them to engage with you deeply around trying to navigate to housing or, or whatever it may be. Um, and I think the question to be asked is how do we layer in public health and safety amenities for those who camp and can that be done on a dispersed basis? I think the answer is yes, but I think Parks and Rec are probably your expert. Um, and then similarly with storage, is there some way to partner? We um, would typically have the ability to do some storage um, when camp abatement was happening, but if no camp abatement is going to happen, is there some 
mechanism there? Can we take what we have used in the past and used it, use it more creatively? Um, people will camp. People will camp outside of designated spaces. Um, and so really mitigating the effects of that. And I think one of the big challenges this summer is going to be food security. I'll be really honest with you. There is no Beans Cafe to walk up to. There's Downtown Hope Center. And then there are the meals that we can take out into meeting people kind of where they're at. Um, there's maybe opportunity sometimes at the Gospel Rescue Mission, but there is not a lot of just meal availability um, and food security is really what's going to drive a lot of what's going on. So I um, just want to put that kind of at the forefront um, previously. Um, and, and I think all of those things that I've just mentioned is it drives this big question, what's the planned investment for summer? Um, because all of those pieces cost money. And then will there be something come winter? My colleagues are already saying, what about next winter? I think I've heard Ms. Johnson say, what about next winter? So it's this tension. Um, but we're here to help and brainstorm and um, but to really think about these practicalities because people are going to camp. Last summer, it was heat. And we tried to keep everyone hydrated and out of the sun. And there was a burn ban. So we had to make sure there was a way to access food with no fire. And then it rained. And it was tarps and raincoats and really trying to keep people dry. And so we have to be ready for everything. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. So um, thank you for raising that issue on food. Um, so I took a tour of Bean's new facility. And I'm just wondering, are you, do you know, and maybe this is just a better question for Beans, but do you know if Beans has the capability of going out to camps and providing food to them? So we've partnered with Beans in a number of ways. They have their mobile food truck. Um, in addition, we can get meals from them to distribute through outreach separately. Um, and I think with their new facility, they have quite the capacity. I think it will come down to a funding issue. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> P. Thanks, Suzanne. And, and I thought the Gospel Rescue Mission was remodeling their kitchen, increasing the size by like 200% or something so they could serve an additional number of, of people. So that might be a resource that uh, some individuals could plan on taking advantage of, even if they can't officially all stay there because they're all maxed out at night, at least it'd be a location to grab a meal. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. I'm next in the queue and then Randy. Um, thanks everybody for the conversation. Felix, I appreciate you bringing this forward in this format so we can just from the very get-go have this conversation and flesh out where the resolution might go from here. Um, Meg, in your other, wearing your other hat a couple <laughs> years ago, I hope it's okay to ask, I think that you were part of, either you or, or maybe it was with Felix, initiated a conversation with the assembly about sanctioned camping. And if I call, recall correctly, um, there were some surveys that went out. And I think Mike, you know, your predecessor, I think maybe provided some feedback as well. Was there, I'm, I'm just wondering like what um, information or, or if anything had come out of that. I think it was disrupted by the pandemic. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to keep my coalition hat on because this was something that we talked about at the advisory council yesterday. Um, the advisory council actually had a number of work sessions and has gathered quite a bit of information about the idea of safe sleeping areas or sanctioned camps. Um, and there's quite a bit of information and practices out there through the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is really, they gather all of the practices and they all like kind of land in one spot. Um, so, so there is information. Um, there's you know, the opportunity to do so. Um, and we've received some feedback um, in the community um, when we looked at it previously. The, I believe the advisory council was looking at it more in terms of um, what if you set up a camping um, opportunity on private lands instead of public lands. And they were hoping to maybe work collectively with like uh, a faith-based organization. So that's kind of what I remember. And I can go back and dig in my notes. I don't know that they ever produced any like documents in writing, but they know they had extensive conversations and we're looking at that model. Okay, thanks, because that is something we all hear. It comes up at community council meetings or we get emails about that. 
but I know that when we start to drill down into the specifics about where and what it will look like and, um, you know, if the park will be here or the place will, you know, take away from other users, then it, it becomes complicated and not as, not as simple and easy as it sounds. Um, though that I, I did want to mention in a conversation with um, a faith organization, they had suggested that they had enough land maybe for maybe not a connex, but like a cottage or like a few small places like in their parking lot. I don't know, um, you know, in terms of issues of health and safety and egress and plumbing and, and, and how that would work. I mean, obviously, um, something like that, I would assume would be more unsupported. Um, otherwise, there would be, right, the need for staffing, which is one of the issues that came up in the conversations about the connexes, too, is that actually there were some real challenges with staffing. And so that's actually um, my second question, then I'll go to Randy, is when we talk about some of these different options, um, I have the impression that staffing will one, it's expensive and hard to find. I mean, how is that, how should we be thinking about that when we, when we talk about um, demobilizing the Sullivan? So there's a couple of things there. And I think with what um, Ms. Johnson um, and her team presented earlier with the safe sleeping spaces, um, those would be staffed spaces and that drives costs, right? Um, and that's a big difference from um, the idea of how Centennial worked last year. And, and it's not inexpensive. And so now you have the tension between basically safe outdoor camping that is staffed against um, investment in something more permanent, something more fixed that has plumbing and all of the other amenities and housing. So that's just the natural tension. It is expensive. Um, we use the rule of thumb in a typical shelter of about $100 a night per person. It's institutional type levels of care because you have to have, I mean, depending on how many people are there, you have to staff them. And I believe the ratios are one to 50 and one to 30 um, at night and day. Yes, I'm really jogging my memory here, but that's for everyone's safety because you have a lot of vulnerable people in a space. And then there's just this tipping point, right? When you get enough vulnerable people in a location, whether outside or inside, they attract predators and that attracts neighborhood impacts as well. So Lots of factors to consider. I don't think the answer is easy. And I think that's why you see a lot of folks go create their own spaces for camping and create their own kind of pods of people that they feel safe with, you know, and it's not in a sanctioned or authorized space, but that they create safety in that. Thanks, Meg. I'll go through the queue. I've got um, Randy, Kevin, and then Daniel. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me. I, I I probably win the award for the most difficult person to understand on the phone. But Meg, I was really intrigued by kind of the mobile um, outreach from like a mobile navigation center. And it got me thinking like a mobile crisis center like um, AP or AFD has or a blood bank type camper system. Have we ever looked at something like that? You know, instead of setting up multiple locations around the city, which I think are probably still a good idea, but having something that can bring the navigation center to these areas where we see a lot of homeless and, and set up and kind of then fan out and hopefully we can draw them in to, to make it convenient and easy for them to seek help. Yeah, thank you for that. So that is the trend around the country is really taking services to the people where they're at and whether that's mobile case management or mobile housing navigation. We, all you need really is, you know, a computer, a hotspot, a person who's compassionate and, uh, you know, willing to do the work, right? Um, it's engagement. Um, and that's really, I mean, you mostly have all been to the Third Avenue Resource Center. It's all about engagement. It's about a space for engagement. And so you can go create that space where people are as well. Um, I don't think it, there's any magic with the four walls. The magic is in the people and the knowledge and coming and meeting people where they're at, literally. So Felix, I would, I would definitely support something like that in this resolution. Thank you. 
Thanks, Randy. Kevin? So as we, as we deal with, as we um, look to serve the population, um, there's a couple different ways we can handle it. One is obviously we need to provide housing because it's really hard to provide treatment and give people resources if they're not housed. You can't just pick them up off the street, uh, give them treatment, and then put them back out on the street. I mean, that doesn't serve them. Where do you? So the housing first, although I, you know, I've grown to accept it as a logical progression. But the other thing is that we need to stem the flow. And then one of these things I don't see these conversations taking place is uh, some of the job training and some of the different resources we have to diminish and get people off it. We talk a lot about where are we going to house them, but I would really like for us to also be having meaningful conversations about what do our job placement look like? What does that training opportunities look like? How do we help people de and how do we get out of that, that, that cycle of recidivism? I've just mangled that word. But anyway, so that cycle and give them skills, because I know that, you know, um, you know, that's a, a big part of recovery. A big part of that is developing, you know, value, self-worth. You know, my experience with traumatized youth is they have a feeling of that, that they've gone through. They've maybe had issues with their family. They self-reflect that. They feel meaningless. And then they self you know, medicate or whatever that looks like because they don't find value. So giving them something external to get value in. And that's why I think employment and job opportunities are so critical. And that'll help decrease the flow. And, and that is actually the solution the long one, part of that treatment and employment. But we don't talk a whole lot about that. So who are our job job treatment partners or job training partners? And what does that look like? Can we get an idea how many heads they have and what resources we have? Because otherwise, if all we do is focus on housing, we'll be doing this forever and the problem will never acquiesce. So thank you. I'm just jumping in real quick, Kevin. It occurs to me that maybe that's something that would fit in CEDC. Well, that's more building bit. codes in Title 21. Is that job training? But you could expand. Community and economic development. Well, we need to find a place to fit it. So Maybe that's why we need to start having the CEDC meetings here rather than at building services, because when they're at building services, we have a tendency just to focus on building services in, in the building department. So thank you. Something to consider. Next is Daniel. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess that's sort of what I'm curious about. And, and um, I think made kind of bristled a little bit when I was talking about prioritizing housing for for um, folks who are getting new jobs. Um, I, I think I like where Felix was going on workforce ready. I, I'm just I'm curious about the intersection of like, for instance, the guest house having extremely low income housing, if if um, you know, folks are newly hired or they're re ready to go through some type of training program. And then the, um, you know, that can help fund part of their lease with the extremely low income. So I, I would just like to explore that. Um, and then, so that's like number one. And I guess my number two thing is I also want to, you know, in terms of safe sleeping sites or folks being able to find their own safety and, and choose where they want to camp, I do want to also keep top of mind, um, you know, there, there's a cost too involved, I think, with just letting folks camp wherever they want to. Um, and in terms of drawing predators and nefarious activity, that's something that in my district, we've, we've certainly seen along the Chester Creek um, green belt where um, there's some ecological repercussions that are happening there that have you know, been... Um, associated with camping there and then there's also you know at least what i hear from my constituents some some public safety concerns there as well um so i don't know i, I and i think that's why i feel this tension of if we have something more structured that we really invested into and yes it would be expensive it would have to be staffed and well operated we got an email from Oh, I got an email from uh, John Weddleton that I circulated to members, and he had, you know, examples of a Mont in Montana of um, a, a sanctioned camp that was not well operated, and uh, you you could kind of certainly see um, the contrast between that and then another camp that was a it was not low barrier, but it was a safe um, camping site, and they had security and it was, um, you know, more, had more structure in the way that was operated. And so there were, according to John, there was certainly a contrast between those two. So 
I don't know. I, I think there's a cost of letting people camp wherever they want to as well that we should consider. Thanks, Daniel. Anyone else want in the queue? Yeah, I would love Meg, Meg actually to respond ahead, if it's okay. So, okay. So, yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about prioritization for housing as it works in the system. There's this list called coordinated entry, and it's by vulnerability, length of time, homelessness, also known as the by name list. So if you think of that this way, and then there are housing opportunities, and they have different requirements. you got to be able to pay rent. There's permanent support of housing, whatever. And they, the way we do it is wherever you intersect on the list, then we start from the top of that first place of intersection. So if you have the means to pay because you, and it, this requires you to pay rent, you will then of course intersect wherever you are on the list. When that housing opportunity comes, if you're at the top, then um, yeah, it works that way. It doesn't though take you to the top, top, the very top is, you know, people who qualify for home for good um, or need permanent supportive housing. But the, the list has that flexibility, but it is important we still use coordinated entry to the extent we can. We don't want there to be where we end up with only the most vulnerable left. Um, so it's really about making sure there's equity um, in the system. Um, but I, I see what you're saying and job readiness and workforce readiness and getting jobs are great. It's a, a key piece to solving homelessness and it's really hard to maintain a job if you don't have a safe place to be, if you don't have a house, you don't have a home. Um, we have some amazing people who uh, are staying at the Sullivan and maintain jobs. We have unsheltered people who maintain jobs, but those are the exceptions, not the rule. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. Thanks, go ahead, Felix. Thanks. Um, so I guess just a, a general comment and then uh, three things from there. So, you know, general comment. Um, I appreciate, especially, you know, in the last like week and a half, a lot of the commentary I've heard of, we need to be more expansive in our thinking. We need to consider all of these other things. And I appreciate all of those comments. Um, you know, for me, I think the issue is, in particular, the Housing and Homelessness Committee is oftentimes captured by emergency, where there was last year emergencies at the Centennial Park campground or emergencies with setting up emergency cold weather, now emergency with demobilizing cold emergency cold weather shelter. And so, um, you know, it just saves so little space for us to have those very interesting conversations that I want to explore of being creative, of looking at all of these other issues. Um, and, you know, as members know, I have tried to have the Housing and homeless, Homelessness Committee meet twice a month <clears throat> for the last few months for us to hopefully expand our conversation a little bit so we're not just stuck and being captured by emergency. And that might be something, <laughs> not that... We all need more at, more meetings in our calendar, but that might be something that I explore going into the future um, because, you know, frankly, there's just so much that we could be doing, could be talking about. There just is not the air in the room for us to do that. And so hopefully we can start to carve that space. Getting into my actual comments. Um, so first is I'm going to go through the suggested changes that I heard. And if anyone wants to correct me, please do. So those changes are for section seven, better defining the population for the task force to focus on. For section five, better defining the population that will be served at the aviator slash, I assume any non-congregate, we need to better define that. I'm gonna look for to the coalition, is that correct? Really any non-congregate, thank you. Um, for section three, better define what short term means. Um, combine into section six the idea of the ASD Connex facilities. Um, and then the inclusion of a new section, or if it makes sense to wrap it into one of the sections um, currently, perhaps section uh, da, 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 
four, which is the discussion of the mobile navigation services. Um, did I capture the notes correctly and are there any additions? Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so are we talking about connexes or are we talking about those removable classrooms that they have? I thought they were connexes. Yeah, Port portable classrooms. Okay. Not, All right. not Connex is a little so, different than a portable classroom. Just, just trying to get the, the, the exact term. Kevin, thank you. Yeah, I was referring to the portables, and thank you. And uh, just to add on, perhaps what we do is rather than pigeonhole ourselves into pallet shelters, we call it non-traditional shelters. So, and I'm just looking at alternative forms. That might be whether that's modular or pallet homes or prefabbed, like. What are all the options that we have that provide housing? I, I mean, and that's what my conversation with that I'm having in development services is what restrictions do we have that can, um, you know, that, that we can quickly utilize to provide clean, safe, nice housing to people? Um, and are there any code provisions that are prohibiting us from doing that in an ex expeditious manner? So thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I think ASD at least used to call them relocatables. I don't know if they still do. Go ahead, Felix. Thanks. All right. Um, so thanks. I've captured those suggested changes. And then um, I will invite the administration to provide any additional thoughts you have to me via email or if you want to meet, uh, however you want to provide those thoughts to me. And then um, I, I think, like I started this meeting, I want to end by just um, getting <laughs> informally the blessing of this body to start acting on some of these ideas and working with the administration on, and community partners on fleshing, fleshing these out. And um, who knows, maybe if, if, we're, if um, I can act fast enough, maybe on April 11th, we'll have a resolution of fruit to appropriate funds to actually do some of this stuff. Um, so I want to get that blessing from the body because this won't be approved until April 11th, but I don't want to wait until, until start acting until April 11th. Which is not in Robert's rules of work. I'm stumped, Felix. Sounds um. <laughs> <laughs> good to me, Felix. Go ahead, Austin. Oh, did you say you? Um, oh, sorry. I just said sounds sounds good. Yeah, I think that um, can probably interpret the lack of objection as you know the kind of um, informal consent that you were looking for. I do have a question. We were talking about the actions and that the whereases aren't written. Did you have any thoughts on what you might include or did you want feedback? Um, yeah, always happy to take feedback. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of our meeting, but yeah, always happy to take feedback um, if folks want to share that with, with me now. Otherwise, I mean, I'll probably just tell the story of emergency shelter, how it was stood up. Now we're looking at standing it down and maybe some other points of fact that I include in there. I would like to include um, something about, you know, the assembly and administration and whoever recognizing that we need more housing and that housing is the solution and shelter is temporary or intended to be, or we want it to be. Anybody else? Pete? I, I know we're down to about 45 seconds here, but um, Kevin had talked earlier about job training, and I was just looking at the relocatables, and I'm thinking, well, they would need to be some, some remodelings done on those. And if we could find some individuals that were interested in uh, learning how to do that type of work, uh, uh, I know there's a high demand for carpentry type of people in our economy right now. So that might be a way to sort of kill two birds with one stone, get some uh, relocatables remodeled, and also train some 
uh, individuals uh, so maybe they could qualify to get a job after after they finish that. Kevin? You know, um, I don't know what that would look like, but the King Career Center goes unused during the summer, and that's a Votech training school for high school students. So I would not recommend mixing the, the adults with children, but during the long periods of time that that facility goes unused, I mean, it teaches diesel mechanics, electrical framing. It's a resource, and there's some sort of partnership. The intention of that facility is to train people to be job ready. We focus on the youth, but during those many months that it goes unutilized, why we can't enter in some sort of partnership to use that resource seems to me to be a waste. Oh, yes, ma'am. If I may, um, Covenant House has piloted something very similar for these skills. They've actually taken them in-house at Covenant House and transition aged youth actually are provided a small micro unit while they go through the training. Um, it's really quite great. Um, I encourage you all to go take a look at it. Um, it is the model to do these types of things. So I just wanted to flag that for you. Great, thanks. Any final comments from any members before I go to Felix? You're good. Okay. Anybody? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. With that, we are adjourned.